All right. Welcome, everybody, to uh, Fluorescent Fridays. This is our sixth event. I'm so excited about this, and I'm so excited about the presentations that we're going to get. My name is John Seymour. I apologize for not being uh, Dr. Lena Cardenas. Uh, she's on vacation where it is beautiful, and her internet is not beautiful. So I had to jump in here. Uh, and I apologize for not having a beautiful Spanish accent that she has, which is, is wonderful. The ISCC, Inter-Society Color Council, uh, developed this idea of uh, Fluorescent Fridays. Uh, it's a new platform for international university students across all di disciplines to network with color professionals and other students to share their cutting edge research with each other. Our goal is to build a, uh, a, a global student chapter that positions color as a multidisciplinary STEAM model, that's science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and provides up-to-date color research by scientists, artists, designers, industry professionals, and university students. All of those groups are represented here. If you're interested in becoming involved, and I hope you are, uh, let's see, if you're interested, then check our website for more information and learn about the benefits of becoming a member. We would love to have you come and join us. Today's event is a special one. Oops, sorry about that. Today, we welcome North Carolina State to be giving the presentations. Uh, let's see here. I, before we get started with this, um, I hope everybody can identify themselves on the uh, chat box. Uh, type in your name and your university, or if you're not from a university, uh, type in where you're from. Uh, keep your camera on uh, mute and your mic on mute. And if you have any questions for the presenters, please put them in the chat and we will save some time at the end in order to uh, have people answer those questions. Okay, so my start of this is to say that uh, today we're going to talk about color quality control an interdisciplinary experience. Color is part of basically every manufacturing process. Almost every manufacturing process, there is somebody at the beginning that says, this is the color that I want. There's somebody in the manufacturing process that says, this is how I'm going to get that color. And another person in that process whose job is to make sure that they got the right color at the end. That's kind of our, what we're talking about today. And in the end, the customer is going to look at it and make a decision about whether to buy or whether to be happy about it based on whether the color is what they were expecting. So uh, let's see, researchers from North Carolina State University's Color Science and Imaging, Imaging Laboratories study human color perception, specification, quantification, and reproduction of color in different media. Many collaborators, many collaborators are involved, including optics, chemistry, and imaging science, physiology, psychology, and mathematics. <laughs> Professor Renzo Shamey and his students will share their recent projects that use color quality control as the central theme linking nearly all of the projects. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker, Dr. Renzo Shamey. He is a distinguished, uh, a distinguished SEBA professor at North Carolina State University and directs activities in the Color Science and Imaging Laboratory. His current research interests include color perception, including multicolor stimuli, unique hues, whiteness, blackness, and grayness, and color difference modeling. Dr. Shamey is a fellow of the Society of Dyers and Colorists, past president of the Inner Society Color Council, editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia of Color Science and Technology, and a North Carolina State University scholar. Welcome, Dr. Shamey, to Fluorescent Fridays. Thank you very much for that nice introduction, John. I really appreciate it. This is our pleasure to be one of the first universities talking about our color research, and uh, I am really pleased to introduce three of my students who are going to be talking about their activities as a part of their PhD process today. Uh, we have amongst our presenters an engineer, a chemist, and uh, a computer scientist, which essentially shows the interdisciplinary nature of the work that we do in relation to color. 
Um, so as far as uh, our university is concerned, we are in, located in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is on the East Coast. Uh, beautiful weather, and uh, I think uh, you'll appreciate uh, knowing a little bit more about our university. NC State is a part of the UNC system, and it's the largest uh, university in the North Carolina university system. Our universities, the national rankings are pretty high up, uh, up there with other universities that are doing uh, a top, top kind of research in terms of national rankings and innovation. We are ranked number one. We have uh, over 34,000 students. Uh, Raleigh as a location to live is uh, consistently rated as one of the best places to live in the nation. Uh, it's a pretty safe place. And in terms of uh, R&D, uh, we have one of the largest, in fact, the largest uh, high-tech R&D center in the US, which is called Research Triangle Park. Um, so it's an up and coming city in terms of uh, living standards as well. Uh, you'll enjoy visiting us. We are welcoming you to come and visit us. Um, Wilson College of Textiles has 121 year history. We are ranked number one worldwide in terms of the research that runs uh, in different disciplines. We have a broad and interdisciplinary group of faculty that do research of over 140 faculty and staff members. Uh, different areas of activity include chemistry, engineering, design, technology, and management. And you can see that color is present in at least three of those, if not all of them. Um, but why do we deal with color? You know, colors are all around us, of course, from the cosmos to the depths of the ocean and the art and the design. And of course, in the field of textiles, color is a very important parameter that makes uh, the decision making a bit easier when you're purchasing something. Uh, but uh, being in the College of Textiles does not restrict us to working only on textiles. Uh, we actually have uh, research on going on plastics, polymers, and other types of material, as well as different uh, imaging kind of technologies. Uh, a question that should really get us going is the question of why color? Why do we need color in the first place? Um, this... Um, this picture from Jeremy Nathans uh, in 2003 elegantly shows that color is not really needed for object detection or object identification, but it does speed up the process of identification of material. Uh, another question that you might start to think about is, uh, well, what, what are colors in the first place? Are they out there in the universe or are, are they constructs of our imaginations? And that's something that I'm going to leave with you to think about. But in terms of um, quality of uh, color, how we see it, well, in terms of survival, if you just uh, consider a primate and imagine looking for food and fruit in a kind of uh, a monotonous world, it would be a very difficult activity. I think you would imagine adding a little bit of color to it and the life becomes a lot easier. So color is an important tool that we use for our survival. Uh, but uh, in addition to survival, color has fascinated scientists, designers, engineers, philosophers throughout history. This is a shameless self uh, kind of uh, promotion from our recent book on uh, pioneers of color science that shows a lot of individuals have been fascinated with the question of color, and it still continues to fascinate us. So quality control of color is an important uh, feature of the work that we do in our university. And uh, the question arises as to whether the consumer experiences the color that the designer intended. If that's the case, the production has been accurate and faithful. If not, this should be a strategic goal that everybody should adhere to. And the process, as uh, John mentioned earlier, uh, really starts with a specification of color. Somebody comes up with a color that needs to be generated and then a group of people are um, going to work to match that color. And this could be a part of the actual um, production cycle, or it could be somebody else, out, you know, elsewhere. Eventually, an agreement is reached between uh, these people and the production is uh, going to start doing the actual work. And all of these jobs, you know, all of these activities can be done under standard light sources and uh, viewing conditions. And if they are done under those conditions, the process uh, becomes fairly straightforward. Uh, but unfortunately, um, consumer is not involved in that process. So, you know, when you're going to your retail store or when you're buying a product, 
oftentimes we are using unspecified light sources and conditions, and this uh, brings the cog outside of the system. So it makes it a bit difficult to control all, all elements of color. So when we think about the different elements, we need to identify them. We need to find out what these variables are because once we identify the variables, uh, we can measure them. And uh, if we are able to measure them, then we can control them. And of course, in absence of uh, identification and measurement control becomes meaningless. Uh, so for a product you know, that uh, is intended to be generated, one thing that can be done is to establish what are the variables that influence the control of color in that process. And human factor is one of the most important elements that influences the quality of color because it really impacts all of the other uh, components as well. And this was done for a particular product. And in the case of textiles, the process can be significantly more complicated. And uh, the designers uh, sometimes, uh, uh, when, they, when they see and appreciate the number of variables that are involved, uh, they kind of get a better understanding of the technical limitations. And uh, the production crew also likes to show this to um, make sure that everybody under, understands the complexity of the process. But even if you are able to identify a variable, it's uh, important to determine what you know how precise you can be in your production and how accurate you can be in your production so it's important to be both accurate and precise um, in order to be able to control the process a little bit better um, so one of the questions that is often asked is you know how hard can it be to control color let's just put that to test and i'd like you to think about this color if you can memorize this color we'll come back to it in the next few slides one of the things that we are interested in doing is uh, quality control of color in multicolored media. And this process is uh, exemplified by showing a pair of camouflage samples here, one used as a standard, the other one as a batch. And uh, the process of evaluating the color is often done visually, and there may be up to seven or more colors present in a camouflage pattern like the one that I'm showing here, as well as transition regions. And in the transition regions, you may be looking at the smoothness of the gradients and stuff like that. So appearance is judged visually and uh, you come up with a pass fail judgment. And this process is often done with one person doing it and the emotional kind of uh, elements uh, may kick in and uh, you may be inconsistent in your judgment. And uh, doing a multiple kind of color assessment is not a simple trivial job either. So if you think about the difficulties involved with that process at the role of illumination, and uh, you can kind of see how a pair of pants, the same pair of pants appears under different light sources. These are the color temperatures that uh, are used to illuminate these uh, pants. And uh, you can see that uh, the color uh, can vary a lot. Color inconstancy then becomes a significant issue that has to be considered in the control of the color. Now I asked you to think about the color, see if you can remember based on the numbers, use the chat box to see if you can look and tell us uh, which color was the one that I just showed you uh, about a minute ago. So if you think that color memory is good, this is a good test to put to test uh, yourselves and the, now the color is shown, um, then maybe this will make it easier to decide which one it was. Maybe not, maybe I have to get it really close to the actual box to get you to understand the color uh, control, especially when we are dealing with it. small color differences can be quite tough, quite complicated. Uh, so in our group, we are interested in the parameters that influence the control of color. Color perception um, is, is of course the most um, important feature of visual assessments. So we are interested in factors that influence that judgment of perceptual assessment of color and ultimately, we are interested in numerically modeling this process. And uh, one part of that numerical modeling is modeling color differences. You know, so we've been doing a lot of work in that area. And uh, the example that I showed with the multicolored material being assessed visually, uh, the idea behind our work, one part of our assessment work uh, involves instrumental and imaging-based uh, technologies that are used for assessing quality of color in multicolored material. 
Um, we are grateful for all the support that we've received, including uh, support from Data Color, uh, who has uh, shared a lot of our, um, who have donated a lot of equipment to our lab. And uh, with that, I'd like to invite you to visit us if you're able to do so in North Carolina. If not, virtually, you can visit our site and uh, come and uh, visit whenever you can. And at the end of the presentations, I'm sure there will be an opportunity for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Renzo. I, 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 I'm always impressed by all the different work that you guys are doing there. Uh, it's, it's great fun. Our next speaker is Jiang Wu, who is a PhD student in fiber and polymer science in the Wilson College of Textiles. She received her MS degree in textile chemistry from NC State University. Her research focuses on the effect of complex backgrounds on the color difference perception involving multicolored materials. Zhang Wu, it's yours now. Are you unmuted? I'm here. Okay. All right. Thank you, John. Hello, everyone. This is Zhang Wu. It's a great honor to present my study today. The title of my presentation is on simultaneous contrast and its effect on perceived color differences. Whether we work with plastics, coatings, or textiles, the color quality control process is important for assuring the color accuracy. There are usually two ways to perform color evaluation. One is visual evaluation and the other is instrumental evaluation. Since color is a personal experience, um, the visual, uh, the instrumental evaluation is rather subjective. So to the subjectivity, instrumental evaluation is always combined to describe color quantitatively. A spectral photometer or colorimeter measuring spot colors as shown in this lower figure on the left, the small yellow dot indicates the area that we measured. We can get calorimetric readings of the measured spot and the spectral info depends on the applied instrument. In many of the color palettes, the color swatches are divided by black border or white space. They do it intentionally to have the colors appear most like they really are. However, in a real thing, simple isolated colors are not commonly seen. Everything that comes to us through our perception is relative, including colors. Moreover, multicolored objects are commonly seen in our daily lives, which contains variegated color pattern, and those colors are always connected. To objectively assess the color quality of those samples, spectral photometers are used. However, there are some challenges for measuring multicolored samples. Most commercial spectral photometers have a limited measuring field. For example, for data color instruments, the smallest aperture available is 2.5 millimeter. However, in real applications, for example, the painting and textile industries, there are a lot of designs that use tiny repeated patterns. When measuring a sample using a spectral photometer, the color included in the aperture will be averaged. It is fine for uniform samples. However, it is sometimes not applicable for measuring multicolor samples. As shown in this right figure, the white portion and the right portion will be averaged to give a single colorimetric reading. However, the results represent neither white nor red. Assume we have an appropriate aperture for our multicolor samples. Those different colors are always assessed one by one while ignoring the influence of the other colors within the scene. However, the perception of a color inside a multicolor sample is influenced by not only the color itself, but also the colors that surround it. A color shifts its appearance when the background is changed. And since the cause and the effects happen at the same time, the phenomenon is known as simultaneous contrast effect. This effect was first described in the 19th century by Schaeffer. Then many color specialists have put effort into study this effect, including Joseph Elbers and Robert Hunt. 
two examples of the contrast effect are shown here. As shown in the left figure, the pink color surrounded by the dark green background perceived the same as the one surrounded by the orange background. However, if the two patches are put together, we will find out that they are actually two colors. And in the right figure, the pointed out region seems painted with the different blue colors, but they are the same as shown in this figure, while the halves of the two images are put together. Another example is shown in this page. As we can see, there are nine distinct colors. The two little dots dashing to each end and appears more and more different. However, if we cover the multicolored background with a gray color, we can clearly see that the two dots are painted using the same color. The color of the dots shifts almost instantaneously when the background color is changing. This phenomenon can cause some problems in the color quality control process for multicolored materials. As shown in this figure, there are three displays. The central target patches are all identical in each pair. So if the central patches are measured by an instrument, the color readings will be identical. While if those samples are viewed by a human observer, the perceived differences between the targets is quite large in the first pair. However, the same background has very little impact on the blue target in pair B, or the same target in the first pair placed on the two background color as shown in the pair C. Therefore, the induction effects can vary substantially depending on the selection of backgrounds and target colors. Those induced color shifts are not accounted in instrumental measurements, which may lead to contradictions between the instrumental readings and visual judgments. SAIE has established a series of basic color difference equations. However, most of them are restricted to be used in real applications. For example, the two homogeneous samples in question should be presented using identical backgrounds and surrounds, etc. Those equations are not suitable for multicolor samples when the background induced color shifts cannot be ignored. Our particular interest is the color assessment of a military marine pattern used in the United States Marine Corps, as shown in this lower figure. This sample contains four colors and consists of patterns of different sizes and shapes. For such multicolor samples, the perceived color difference will be influenced by the surrounding colors. For example, the two regions are all painted with khaki. However, the color may look different since they are surrounded by different colors. Two major challenges for measuring multicolor samples using the spectral photometer is one, the size limitation of the aperture, and the two, discounting the effects of the surrounding colors. The limitation of the aperture size can be solved by using a camera-based colorimetric system, from which color readings can be obtained for each pixel on a captured image. However, for majority of those systems, the colored pattern are segmented into single colors and the color assessment are always based on isolated colors. To better present how human observers perceive a color on a multicolor sample, the influence of different backgrounds should be considered and incorporated into the system design. Since the study basic color difference measures are restrict restricted to be used under fixed viewing conditions, more complicated models were then developed. Those include color appearance models and image appearance models. So there are many different models. The simultaneous contrast prediction of those models are not satisfactory. And the goals of this study is to model in the perceived color difference of colors on MARPET pattern. For a multicolor sample, there are many parameters involved in defining a complex background. Due to the high variability of those parameters, if such a stimulus is applied for simplicity, the appearance of the central color is always predicted using an average uniform background in many psychophysical studies. Therefore, the first step of this project is to determine if the problem of assessing complex background can be reduced to using an average uniform background for our MARPAN colors. Step two of the project focuses on comparing the color differences of pairs of stimuli embodied within different colors of backgrounds. 
To achieve these goals for the two steps, we're performing psychophysical experiments to collect the actual perceived differences. While monitor-based samples are judged by human observers, the obtained visual data will then be used in color difference modeling. Some of the results from part one are shown here. In part one, there are three different checker sizes applied in sample design, as shown on the left figure. The background is divided into four, eight, or 16 checkers per side. The observer responses for three more pet color combinations are shown in the right figure. There are two subfigures. The first subfigure summarizes the visual color difference responses for each sample pair represented by box plots. The second subfigure represented by stacked bars shows the percentage of match and not match responses. As we can see, for the three listed combinations, no obvious differences were seen among the responses obtained using different checker size. For the first and third background, half people reported seeing same central color, while for the middle pair, most of the people reported seeing different colors. The results indicating the average background may be used to replace, to replace some complex backgrounds in color assessment of MARPAD pattern, while it is not applicable for the rest. Last, let me give you a brief summary of what I've been talking. First, the perceived color and appearance of a multicolor sample are highly dependent on surrounding colors due to the contrast effect inducing color shifts of the central color. Second, the influence of the backgrounds are commonly ignored in color quality control process for multicolor samples, which could raise contradictions between visual assessment and instrumental readings. Hence, it is important to assess and improve the performance of color difference models to predict the perceived color difference for multicolor samples. And that's the end of my presentation. Um, I will be happy to answer any questions later in the Q&A session. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jang. Uh, one of the things that I really like about your presentation and all of them that I've seen here are that you've explained things in a good enough manner that everyone can uh, understand this. Next, we move on to Jean Zhu Luo, uh, who is a PhD student in the fiber and polymer science program at the Wilson College of Textiles. She received an MS degree in textile engineering from NC State in 2018. Her research interests include the role of color on perceived attractiveness, color measurements of polymeric products, visual color perception, and digital color imaging. Her current research focuses on modeling the effect of texture on visual and instrumental color difference assessments of fabrics and polymeric materials. Take it away, please. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, John, for the kind introduction. And thanks, everyone, for being here. My name is John Hua Luo. And today, we're going to discuss about color quality control from polymeric palettes to products. As we we'll all agree, plastic is in every single element of our daily lives. Examples include the plastic packing of food, the synthetic clothing, toy, and one of my favorites, Lego brick. Making plastic products is generally started with various raw materials that make up the monomers. Then the monomers carry out polymerization reaction, which produce polymer resins. The polymer resins are usually in the form of pallets or beads. They are collected and further transported to the manufacturing facilities, where the polymer resins are processed into final plastic products. With the growing use of polymers in many industrial fields, the specification of polymer quality at the same time becomes increasingly important. The industry is therefore concerned with quality control from the simple starting ingredients to final plastic products. As we know, polymeric palettes possess varieties of properties, and those features may correspondingly reflect on the characteristics of the products. Among those properties, we're mainly interested in the color metric and the spectral properties of the palette, as color is an important aesthetic element of plastic quality. 
Sometimes colorants are added to make the products with various colors, and sometimes they are produced as they are. So the products are almost colorless with different degrees of transparency. Before the pellets form a product, they generally go through the molding process where the pellets are exposed to various effects like heat, pressure, shear, et cetera, during the process. Thus, the color of the resin pellet is not necessarily directly related to the color of the final product. To better control the properties of the final products, it is important to establish a relationship between the pellets and the associated products. However, the products may vary in their surface features post-processing. Those factors also affect their color properties. For the supplier of pellets, an agreed form of homogeneous product that is produced from the resin pellets is needed. One solution is producing the polymeric plaque as plaque has flat surfaces with sufficiently large dimensions, both its reflectance and transmittance can be easily measured using color measuring instruments. Those values can give the customers a better understanding of the color properties of the final products. Another advantage of producing the plaque is that it makes the transmittance measurements possible. As we know for transparent or translucent products, we're mainly interested in the color based on their transmittance measurements. For the pellets, however, it is difficult to, it is usually difficult to obtain reliable transmittance values as the pellets are inhomogeneous. Thus producing the plaque can provide a way to describe the transmittance of the final product. Therefore, in the study, we are aimed to establish the relationship between the reflectance of the pellets and the transmittance of the cor corresponding plaque for the purpose of better quality control. To establish the relationship, the first step is to measure the color of the samples. This is generally achieved by using spectral photometers. The spectral photometers are instruments that measure the reflectance from or the transmittance through materials as a function of wavelength. We have a variety of instruments and models in our lab, including portable handheld ones, conventional benchtop machines, and an imaging-based spectral photometer. For the pellets, their reflectance measurements are generally done in bulk form. It is a routine method, and ASTM has proposed a standard practice for their color determination. According to the standard, the pellets should be filled inside a clear glass sample cup with a minimum of 15 millimeter depth and measured by a calibrated colorimeter or spectral photometer. Following this practice, the instrument can yield the spectral reflectance, color values, as well as yellowness index of the bulk pellets. In addition to the routine standard protocols, we are also examining the possibility of measuring a single pellet. This measurement is conducted by the imaging-based spectral photometer that allows us to measure the single pellet. The instrument first captures the image of the pellets. The pellet, the user is then allowed to select the area that is of interest. Then the software processes the image segmentation that excludes the pixels out of the selected area and populates the color values and the spectral reflectance of the sample. So for the pellets, we can determine the reflectance of the bulk pellets and that of the single pellet. Well, we can obtain both the reflectance and transmittance of the plaque. In the study, we are interested in establishing the relationship between the reflectance of the pellets and the transmittance of the plaque. There are several ways to achieve this objective, but we adopted a unique method. Our first step is to estimate transmittance based on the reflectance measurements of the plaques of the pellets using a model and then relate estimated transmittance with the measured transmittance of the plaque. The model that we use to relate the measurable reflectance with the transmittance is the kubelka monk theory. As the name suggests, the, the theory was proposed by two scientists, Kubelka and Monk. The KM theory was proposed based on a simplified model of light propagation. And the key assumption in applying this 
there is that only two fluxes are considered, one traveling downwards and another one traveling upwards. Due to its simplicity, the KM theory has been widely used to model the reflectance of the transparent layer, translucent and opaque materials. In our study, we consider a special case that a transparent layer atop an opaque substrate. Based on the KM theory, if we can measure the reflectance of the layer over two different backgrounds and that of the two backgrounds, the reflectance and transmittance of the isolated layer can be estimated. Therefore, we obtained a way to estimate the transmittance of the layer based on its reflectance over two different backgrounds. To test the performance of the model, we tested by measuring two types of polymeric pellets, the PMMA acrylide and NAS90 pellets. They are measured by the imaging-based machine, which can determine the reflectance of the single pellet. For the substrate, we use the BCRA tiles. These are standard samples that are commonly used for control and verification of measurement results among the instruments. In particular, we use the achromatic ones because we want to avoid the effects of backing colors. The measurements were performed by determining the reflectance of each single pellet over each of the achromatic BCRA tiles. Thus, for each pellet type, we have five different backings that's forming 10 different tile pairs. From each pair, we can estimate transmitting spectrum based on the reflectance values. Thus, we can obtain 10 estimated transmitting spectra in total. Those values were compared with the measured transmittance of the plaque so as to establish the relationship between the pilot and the associated plaque. Among the 10 tile pairs, the best performing tile combo was selected based on the sum of squares and total color difference between the estimate and measured values. The best performing combo is the one shows the minimum sum of squares and total color differences. This page shows the results for the two types of pellets. The red solid curves are the measured transmittance of the plaque. The dotted curves are the estimated transmittance based on the reflectance measurements. And they are estimated based on the best performing tire combos. Interestingly, the pale gray and mid gray combo provides the best of performance for both pallet types. The sum of squares and total color difference values are also listed in the table. We can see from the results that um, this estimation method provides a good accuracy because the minimum color difference and the sum of square values are fairly low. Um, the minimum color difference uh, can be as low as 0.03 units. That can sometimes be negligible in practical terms. Thus, we obtain a reasonable, reasonably accurate relationship between the reflectance of the pellets and the associated plaque. Here is the summary of today's presentation. Firstly, we can achieve improved quality control of polymeric products by estimating the relationship between the pellets and the associated plaque. We determine those relationships by estimating the transmittance of plaque using the model based on the kubelka monk theory. And the study showed promising results that the minimum color difference can be less than 0.2 units, which, which indicate a good accuracy in estimating plaque's transmittance based on the reflectance measured by the pellets. Um, that's all for my part. I am happy to answer your questions at the Q&A session. Okay. So a reminder here, uh, make sure that if you have questions, put them in the chat box. That was yet another uh, excellent presentation and a uh, very interesting topic. We're going to move on now to our last speaker, Hao Chue. He's a PhD student in textile technology and management in the color science and imaging laboratories. Having come from an information technology background, his interest in research lies deep in, uh, it lies in deep learning and digital image processing. He has also worked in a textile global supply chain for more than seven years. 
He is currently developing a web application to diagnose and troubleshoot coloration faults using deep learning techni uh, technology. So I pass this along to Hao. Thank you. Uh, uh, can you see the shared screen? I apologize. Yes, we're, we're good with the screen. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, thanks for joining me for this uh, presentation. Uh, so today I'm gonna briefly introduce a topic about uh, color control of colored objects by applying deep learning method and the image-based uh, analysis. So uh, imagine we were a quality control worker in a fabric coloration facility. I mean, you know, like uh, dyeing mills or printing factories. Uh, we saw these uh, fabric images captured from the production processes and uh, we saw some anomalies. Uh, so as our responsibility, we need to figure out uh, what types of uh, defects we're dealing with. And also we need to figure out, uh, you know, the reason why we have these, uh, you know, defects identified in the process, right? Um, okay, so you may uh, think the previous example is not the relevant, uh, that relevant to our daily life, but I promise you this is a very relevant example to each of us since uh, most people will grow 10 to 40 more during our lifetime. And uh, some of us will encounter different types of uh, skin diseases like uh, psoriasis. So how, uh, how do we know if it is a benign more or some skin disease like uh, psoriasis or even cancerous ones like uh, melanoma? Okay, so uh, what would we do when we are dealing with these problems? Of course, uh, you can turn to some experts for help. So in the fabric case, we could uh, you know, give some advice from uh, coloration experts. And uh, in our skin uh, case, uh, we could uh, definitely visit to the dermatologist to get some diagnosis. But uh, what is the catch? Um, first, uh, you know, we always need to make some appointments to meet either uh, coloration experts or doctor. Um, second uh, thing we need to think about is the cost. So um, finally, even if you are an expert, you are prone to make errors. So what if uh, we could uh, use the help from the machine since uh, image-based analysis of uh, faults can you know, overcome several challenges in the quality control of colored objects in different sectors. So, but here is uh, one, uh, a uh, $1 million question. So how, um, how are we gonna let uh, machines uh, or computers in this case do the job that needs the diagnosis from the expert? To answer the question, here are some concepts that uh, I wanted to introduce. First, since we want to let computers read the images, we need to understand how computers see the digital images. So basically, digital images are regarded as a form. As a matrix. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. Oh, okay. So <clears throat> not the movie, but the concept from linear algebra. So the image on the left side shows how the 2D grade looks like. Here, um, you know, these three matrices represent three different color channels, uh, red, green, and blue. And the color digit image is basically the stack of these three matrices. Um, the figure on the right just show us how the image could uh, be split into three different color channels and then recombine into the color image. Another gap before we can make our computer to be an expert, you know, we need to let our computers understand uh, uh, what they are seeing based on the images we provided. So deep learning is the potential solution here. Um, the basic idea is quite simple. We wanted our computers to learn from many examples like uh, what our humans do. So basically we want our computers could uh, identify or locate the objects in the images. So this image here shows an example. So with enough example, examples, um, computers could differentiate among a dog, and, uh, a person and a horse here. So, but how computers could uh, you know, understand or process this information? So when our humans see some information, um, in this case, some uh, text in our mobile phone, our brain, uh, our uh, biological neural network can make the sense of the images based on the different level of the information, uh, starting with the uh, neurons in the first visual area of cortex V1, which recognize the edges, then move to the second cortex V2. So the information was uh, subsequently sent to higher level to detect the entire object. Uh, so similarly, uh, the deep learning based neural networks kind of mimic the biological ones 
uh, you know, can capture the, these different types of uh, level of information, uh, you know, from the pixels to edges, uh, to shapes, you know, to the higher level meaning of the information. <clears throat> also, uh, color is one of the most important features in most objects. So the information of color can also be processed in such neural networks uh, besides the information of shapes and uh, edges. So uh, here's an example of how we use the deep learning method to detect the skin disease such as uh, melanoma and uh, psoriasis. Uh, over 2000 images were used for training and testing purposes so that the computers could identify the located disease just as uh, a uh, dermatologist does. Uh, as you can see here in the image on the top, the diseases were identified and detected inside these anchor boxes. Uh, the detected images was also uh, segmented based on the pixel in intensity of the disease region as the image on the bottom displays. So here, the, the, this one is for the melanoma and another one is for the psoriasis. So for this project, uh, we used the deep neural networks just as the previous examples mentioned. The neural networks uh, uh, attempts to make sense of the images from the pixels to different level of information, uh, including the shape and the colors of the diseases. Another uh, project that we are working on is trying to find a user-friendly and scalable solution to identify the fabric defects in the coloration process. So first, we would like to build an image API service and design an image gallery. So here, API stands for the application programming interface. To put it simple, so basically, API could make software communicate with each other through it. So in our case, API could allow users and researchers get access to these images and even upload their own for their current or future research projects. Uh, we also want to train and deploy the deep learning model, you know, to identify and locate the defects based on the features such as colors, edges, and the shapes of the defects. Uh, finally, there will be some explanation regarding the defects identified. Uh, so one of the most core elements is to deploy a, a deep learning model to identify fabric defects. Here is an example of the printing fabric with at least seven defects. So the defects uh, inside the red bounding boxes are ref here refers to some uh, dirty area and color differences. And those uh, inside the blue uh, circles refer to some uh, small uh, mechanic uh, uh, defects. So I will show you how deep learning method could help do the job. Uh, here's the model we proposed for our project. I just wanted to provide some intuitive explanation to you uh, to help you uh, understand this uh, structure. So basically we will have an uh, input image. The image will be kind of fed into a pre-trained deep neural network to extract the features just like what I showed you before. So the neural networks here try to figure out these different types of level of information. Uh, you know, from pixels to higher level of meanings, including shape and the color. Um, then a uh, feature map will be uh, generated. Uh, a sliding window will slide over this feature map of the entire image. And the anchor boxes with different sizes will be generated around the center of each uh, uh, sliding window. So a uh, multi-dimensional vector as well as these uh, anchor boxes will go through another two layer, um, two layers. So one neural layer called the classification layer is basically responsible for deciding the object categories. And another one called the regression layer, so is, which is used to locate the object. So here, uh, the computer tries to get uh, a higher level of meaning of the information. Then a, um, a, um, you know, a regional proposal, including the information of classification and the anchor boxes will be uh, extracted. So then based on this proposal, uh, to make it simple, a, a neural network called the faster RCNN, which including uh, several uh, different uh, neurons layers is trained to detect the objects in the entire image. So here one arrow represents the classification and the another shows the location. So as you can see here, uh, seven defects area are detected based on this final neural network. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, training examples are very important so the computers could uh, learn from these examples. In this project, uh, we have collected over 9,000 images from different sources. Uh, the image data set uh, covers uh, 15 types of uh, fabric defects identified in the coloration process. Uh, below are four examples with three uh, defects. The first one is uh, uh, 
oil stain, and the second one is uh, broken ends, and here are some uh, color differences. Uh, the final one is uh, another broken end shows there. Um, and uh, here are some examples of how user interface may look like. So basically a user could upload an image, you know, to get the prediction of the defect by loading the pre-trained deep learning model and the user could then uh, use the information of the defects by redirecting to this uh, explanation page. And uh, yeah, thanks again for listening to this presentation and uh, I will welcome and uh, to any questions in the Q&A session. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Uh, yet another very good presentation, very interesting stuff. Uh, we are now open to any questions. If anybody has uh, questions or comments, or perhaps someone has uh, some uh, takeaways, what did they? What did you learn from this? Uh, please, uh, something for the chat box. Any comments, Luann? Um, yes, um, I thought that was excellent. Congratulations to everyone. I'm not coming from a science background. I come from art and design and I found this area to be so interesting and so important and an area that we just really haven't learned about and understand how color is so important to everything that we buy. So I guess um, I, I also would like to see in the chat box if all of you, if you're not coming from this background, what what did you what what did you, was your takeaway from this? And um, you know what what or what would you like to learn more about? And I I actually have a question about the deep learning model. Um, so my question is, um, you know, I'm guessing at North North Carolina State, you're doing more of that kind of work that we just heard about. And what what does how has that department changed in the last few years or that area? Um, and where is it? Where where is it going? I would think it's really going to be continuing to grow. I find that to be really fascinating. How <laughs> are you take this yeah. question now? Yes. Yes, Brent. I'm just really interested in how how the deep learning model, like when, when did that, I guess you've been doing that kind of research. It has been continuing to grow. But my question is for those of us that are, you know, are less familiar with it, um, I guess you're having to bring new, new equipment in. And I would think that this is an area that's really developing a lot, like, you know, with the time, new equipment, new technologies. Yeah, so this is a computational research, really. Most of the work uh, really involves, um, in, in some cases, powerful computers that can do fast processing. And uh, in other cases, you know, providing you have uh, a reasonable setup, computing setup, um, the, the idea behind it is to collect as much information and data as you can. And that's the first part because there is a training that is involved. And that training can be in different fields. You know, it could be in a news, uh, you know, in broadcasting and prediction of weather, it can be in a whole kind of array of different areas. And we are essentially extending it to color and color related activities, you know, so we are trying to identify shapes as, uh, as how explained, we are trying to use color information to examine uh, health and medical kind of problems as well as textiles as, uh, as well as production issues. So it's a growing area and because of the widespread availability of computing power, including in our phones, uh, we are now able to really collect the information and to make it available to a wider kind of public. Uh, so it is a growing area and it is going to expand, uh, continue to expand, uh, I predict in the next few years. And uh, the, the main thing is going to be you know, the accuracy of the system. And of course, with more examples, with more data being made available, the accuracy is going to improve. And I, I predict that this in the very, in the not too distant future, I think this is going to become a routine method for identification of a lot of problems. Uh, thank you, Renzo. Uh, let's see here. There was a question from Jean on the simultaneous contrast where there were a, a checkerboard pattern behind the uh, 
seeing was there a determination of which checker size was the best for evaluation? Actually, from our results, there's not much differences among the three checker size we've tested. That's from 0.6 to, I believe, 2.5 degrees in size. And that shows the similar results we obtained from our observer, at least for the colors we're using. OK, thank you. Let's see here. There's a question. Uh, will we be able to get a copy of this recording? Yes, we are recording it. And uh, there will be an email that comes out. Is that right, uh, Luann? Yes, and we, we're, we keep working with our technology on pulling it together. So bear with us if we have a little bit more of a timeline. But uh, before you get that, but definitely we'll do that and you'll get, you'll, you'll have an email as John just said, and we'll, we have a YouTube channel that will have it up. It takes a little bit to process it, but we definitely want to get that to you. Uh, there's another question about the uh, uh, next event. Uh, do we have a date for that yet? Or what, when is that? That's going to be the last Friday in April. Okay. And it will be, and please stay tuned to that. We're just start pulling that one together right now, but it will also feature another university. We um, won't say exactly who that is yet, um, but that's our focus for fluorescent Fridays. Now we started with uh, the one in October from Spain. We have this one in North Carolina today and we'll have another university in. So it will be the last Friday in April. Okay, here's a question for the second presentation. Uh, did you use chromatic samples? Uh, in other words, samples that were other than uh, the clear plastic uh, to compare the color difference? Are there results? Are those results as good as achromatic samples? Um, that is a very good question. Actually, we're right now we're um, we're comes some um, samples with tint in tint in it, but uh, right now we. Um, don't have the exact uh, data for that sample, but yeah, we will keep you posted. Okay, very good. Uh, here's another question. Uh, let's see here. With so many variations in the design, I think this is for how, how do you distinguish between a textile design and an error? Can you uh, repeat the question? Sorry. Your sound's a little bit on and off. Yeah, we're you're okay now. Yeah, yeah. So the question was for you, um, how, do you how do you decide between an error and something mm -hmm. that is a legitimate part of the design? Uh, I think uh, we just, uh, this project, uh, we, as I mentioned, uh, we just uh, focus on the the defects uh, or the faults in the coloration process. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't, uh, you know, take the uh, coloration process of design to the consideration of uh, when we designed our project. So yeah, this is not uh, the scope of our project, I would say. We just only consider the uh, coloration process of uh, dyeing and the printing uh, process for the fabrics. Okay, thank you. So, so in other words, if there's a problem with the design, if there's a problem with the design, um, a deliberate problem with the design, we, we don't we don't have that at this point in time, you know. So it is uh, it's easier to examine you know color problems that are due to bad registration, for example, or non-homogeneity or some other similar problems, but you know, considering what is an actual design element is gonna take additional uh, training. As long as, uh, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Professor Shemia. So as long as you have, uh, you can provide uh, enough sample, as I mentioned, uh, you can provide enough samples, like designing samples uh, to, for the deep learning models to understand uh, the meaning of the, the arrows, then yeah, it will, be, it will okay. work as well. I think we're at time here. So I would like to certainly thank our presenters from North Carolina State. 
and uh, for the wonderful job, the information that was uh, so uh, enthralling today. Please spread the word about Fluorescent Fridays. Save the date for the next one. Um, if you're interested in uh, participating this, uh, in this, don't hesitate to contact us. Um, I don't have a contact information uh, email here. Luann, do you have that? Oh, um, let's see. I'm going to actually you. turn that over to Jean. Yes, they can use ISCC office at, uh, dot, at ISCC.org. You want to put that in the chat box, Jean? Uh, yes, I can. And how do you spell ISCC? <laughs> Funny, John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John, and I have one more comment before we all head out. I just, uh, Julie Klein had left a, a message, I mean, a, a, a comment, and she said, I work in the hair and in color industry. I thought it was very interesting when we covered controlling the lighting. Definitely a hard thing to get the hair color perfect under all lighting. It's a constant challenge. So I was just thinking that the, this, the idea of how do you measure color under what conditions, this was so helpful to, you know, to us to understand more of how that works. So thank you to everybody. Okay, so um, I'm gonna call for an end of this. Is that, uh, unless anybody uh, wants to jump in for something else? All right, well, thank you for joining us today and uh, have a wonderful fluorescent Friday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.